sometimes if you're a single, if you're flying single, you can just fly out, right? You can find a way to do that, standby or whatever. But you guys know, I don't know if, if you all know this, but airlines were just whacked this weekend. There was a storm and a bunch of other things going on in the Northeast, and they lost all their... So, so he, his wife, and his three kids were coming. <laughs> so the five of them weren't able to get a flight until like this afternoon. So <laughs> they weren't able to come. So you got me. So I found this out yesterday morning. Um, and yesterday was my daughter's wedding. <laughs> so, and, uh, so anyway, so what we're going to do, and I plan on doing this in January anyways, we're, we're going to kind of review the philosophy of ministry of Calvary Chapel of the Coastlands. And it's not just a philosophy of ministry for Calvary Chapel Coastlands. I, I dare say it's a philosophy of ministry that should be the philosophy of ministry for all of our lives as well. And uh, we've gone through different things over the years, and, and just over the last probably six to eight years, God has just really refined what our church is about, and I'm just really blessed at, at how he's uh, focused us in a certain direction. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And before I go on, um, I do want to thank you. Guys, there was dozens and dozens and dozens of people that helped out with the wedding. Uh, there was a, a lot of people that actually helped out with the wedding and preparing for the wedding uh, that didn't go to the wedding <laughs> because... As a pastor, you, I could probably invite a thousand people to the wedding, you know, and uh, it wasn't about me, it wasn't about my wife, it was about my daughter, and, uh, and then some people, I know people get overlooked, and we are so sorry for that if that happens, because, you know, we could invite a thousand people, and then McKenna married into a family with seven kids, <laughs> you know, and so they could have invited a thousand people, and, uh, and so... Uh, um, you know, and so, you know, if you didn't get invited, it was nothing personal. It was just a matter of fact, we had to limit it. And if I invited all of you, I'd have to buy dinner for all of you. Forget that. <laughs> Tithe more. No, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it was, it was, it was a blessing. And, and w one thing we're going to do soon is we're actually going to have a Sunday service over in this other building just, just for fun on a Sunday uh, for you guys to see it. I mean, it, it was a warehouse, right, for, for Harvey Relief. I mean, that's what it was. And then it was, every church has a catch-all. That was our catch-all. It was like, and then we had kids practicing volleyball and breaking things. And, you know, just, I mean, it's just chaos. And so a month ago, when, when we, we realized that we weren't able to go to the Isibo's Ranch because too many people responded, um, uh, we, we realized we had to have it here. And, man, everybody jumped in. And that, that place is beautiful looking over there. It's, it's just amazing. So it's, it's a blessing, and, and we have all kinds of ideas for outreach and so on and so forth. And we love having one service. So, you know, we did really well financially last year, so we're looking to AC it over there as well. And uh, so that will be a blessing. So if, if we're able to grow to 600 people and have one service, what a blessing that would be, right? And so uh, we're even praying about that as well. So we'll, we'll see what the Lord um, does with that. But uh, anyways, thank you guys so much and uh, for all your help and, and all. And it was just a, a huge blessing. All right, let's go ahead and pray. And we'll get into our, our teaching this morning. Dear God, we just ask that... Uh, Lord, you would just help us focus our lives. Lord, it is so easy to be distracted away from the things that ultimately really matter most. And Lord, even those of us who are in your word every day and who study, uh, and for me, just my, my life is studying and teaching. And Lord, I can get distracted. So Lord, certainly I know that those that you have called out into the oil fields or into the classrooms or... Or, or wherever it may be, God, can be so distracted. And, and I just pray that, that today, by your Holy Spirit, you'd focus us on those things that ultimately really matter. And even though the world may even look at it as weak, Lord, we would know that your effectiveness is found in our obedience to your greatest call. And so may it be that today we refocus on you. May it be that those that aren't focused, Lord, find a focus today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, in many churches over the years, I've, I've run into a lot of philosophies of ministry. And what is that? Well, it's a purpose you exist, right? So, you can start a church and start teaching the Bible, and then someone wants to do this. Oh, yeah, let's do that. And then you find yourself scattered to the wind, right? And, and you're doing so many different unique things, you, you don't really have a focus or a purpose, you know? And, and so, very often, churches will set out a, a philosophy of ministry or, or purpose statements or even slogans, right? And so, we, we hear this a lot in Calvary Chapel. It's win, train, and send, right? And that's a very, it's a great philosophy of ministry. And then you have uh, the, the church I came from, Pastor David Rosales, his, his was the four W's, and I don't know where he got that. It was before 
W became president, you know, so he, he had these pillars, and he still has them today. It's, it's witness, witness, worship, and word. And that's a good philosophy. It keeps you focused on, on what you're supposed to be focused on. Uh, when we first moved here, we had one called well. Are you well? Are you worshiping? Are you evangelizing? Are you learning? And are you loving? And they're great philosophies uh, of ministry or purpose, but, but God desired to focus us more. So over the years, I came up with a few new ones, and we, we were under these for a while. One was teaching the Word of God to know the God of the Word. So we want you to know God, not just the Word, right? And, and I want you to know God more than, than knowing where the Scripture that's bouncing around in your head is, right? I want you to know Him through the Scriptures, and that's a good one as well. Uh, others, you know, my, my daughters went to a church in, in, um, in Waco, and theirs was a passion for Jesus and his purposes in this earth, right? That's a good one. But I did read a book by their pastor, and, and one of the things, this book, it was called The Three Loves, and, and it really helped us formulate our, our ministry philosophy here. So our philosophy here, you can see it on that corner on a red and white sign, which doesn't fit with our color motif. Us men didn't care. The women cared, you know. <laughs> but, and we have a sign out here that says the same thing. And I, I did change the sign a little bit. But our philosophy is love. And we have priorities in love. It's love God, love each other as the body of Christ, and love the lost and dying world, right? And, and so it sounds great. But we're going to dive in and see what that looks like even practically. And we're also going to talk about how the Holy Spirit helps us fulfill this particular commission. And so in Mark chapter 12, you're, most of you are familiar with this passage. It says, then one of the scribes, so what is a scribe? A scribe is like a, an intellect, a scholar, a philosopher, right? One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first, and when it says first in the Bible many times, it, it's what is the preeminent? What is the primary? Okay, what is the best? What is the greatest? What is the, the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus answered, and, and he said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, uh, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first. This is the primary commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In another passage, it says, In this, all the law is fulfilled to love. So the purpose of the Ten Commandments is not to become a moral robot. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is learn how to love God and to love one another. Guys, this is the greatest commandment, to love, right? And, and so when I say love God, love people... There are two types of people, in a sense, if you're a believer and a part of the church. Because we have believer and unbeliever. And, and the idea behind that is, is the fact that, that God does command us. In, in Galatians 6.10, it says, Always do good to all, especially to the household of faith. <laughs> right? And, and, and you need to understand, if a man is serving deeply in ministry but completely ignoring his wife, he needs to quit the ministry and go to his first ministry on earth, which is his wife and his family. And so the Bible does have certain priorities. You don't have a right to go evangelize people if, if you haven't evangelized your own family first, right? And so there's this idea that, that, that the church needs to love one another. Guys, and understand, if a church loves one another, it's the greatest form of evangelism in the church because the world doesn't have the kind of love that the church has, Right? And so we're to love one another. And then once we love one another, we now have the right to go out to the world to share what love is really all about to a lost and dying world that needs the message that you have. Right? And so there, there are two types of people. And I want you guys to understand, God in the scriptures, I don't know anywhere where God lifts up one race over another race. One, one skin pigment above another skin pigment. One, one texture of hair above a, another texture of hair. One broadness of nose above, a, above another broadness of nose. Right? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's Hitlerian. You know what God recognizes? Believer and unbeliever. 
throughout the scriptures. That's how he divides people. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked to who? A black person, a white person, a yellow person, a red person? No, it says, do not be unequally yoked, what? To an, to an unbeliever. You know, and so that's what God sees. He doesn't, he doesn't see race. And, and I've studied it. The genetic code that makes, you know, our noses different shapes and, and our eyes different colors, guys, is minuscule. Minuscule. It's, it's tiny. I could bring my brother up here. He's 6'2", has dark eyes, dark skin. He looks like a Mexican, right? And here I come, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes look like some Aryan, right? You know, and it's like, what in the world is happening here? Guys, it's just genetics. It's just genetics, and you know what? God came as a Middle Eastern man, you know, and, and he did not come as a red-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned guy that never had a dirt ring on him and walked three feet above the ground and floated around like we see in pictures. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter uh, 53, he had no comeliness or he had no beauty that we would be like, oh, that's Jesus, I can tell by the way he looks. You know the old pictures with the halos? Nope, he didn't walk around with a halo above his head. God wanted to show off his character in a normal looking man to give us an example that we could follow and for us to understand that God completely became man. And, and so, so he recognizes unbeliever and believer and, and the right that gives us to reach out to other people is the fact that we love one another. So we're going to talk about that a lot. I decided to go slow or go short today, but there I go off my notes again. Sorry about that. <laughs> but 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We know this is the love chapter, right? Love is important. Whole chapter specifically dedicated to it. 1 Corinthians 16.22 says, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Oh, huh. that's the apostle of grace. Good job, Paul. <laughs> is love important? It is, absolutely, right? You need to love the Lord. 1 John 2.9, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause in stumbling for him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 1 John 4.7, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. Pretty radical, right? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also may love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, is love important? Love is radically important, right? And guys, for someone like me, I like to be alone. You know, and, and when I was younger, I, I, I was nice to people, but I was abjectly selfish, like absolutely selfish. If you can get me to the beach, I liked you. You were my friend. If your car broke down, I'll find another friend. You know, I just, you know, it's like, I was nice, and, and I wouldn't, like, you know, but, but I'm not going to go out of my way to care for you unless you could give me something back. And, and, and so for someone like my personality, when, when I became a Christian, all of a sudden, I'm actually supposed to care and be concerned about someone else's needs above my own. And, and so I trip out on me. Because God gave, made me a pastor, and I actually care. It's like I've, I've been a senior pastor for 21 years. It's not an act anymore, okay? It's not a fad. I got over it. Like, I actually care about the people I'm ministering to. And guys, that isn't a brag. That's like, wow, because that's not me. That's the fact that God has said, one, you must love. Two, he didn't just say you must love and grunt it out. He said, you must love, and I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And the more you allow the Holy Spirit to fill your life, I I've equipped you also to be able to love. He doesn't tell us to do things that we're not equipped to be able to do. And guys, I know, I know, man, many of you come from different places, and many of you ha have come from hard backgrounds and everything else. And the thing is, you can't just go, I'm going to know the Word of God so well I can quote it up one, down, one side and down the other, and I'm going to religiously go to church. And I, but you know what? Beyond all that, you need to learn to love. And you need to allow God to teach you to love. And you need to surrender to that love. 
and the world sees love as a weakness, it's God's most touted strength. God will talk about his omniscience, his omnipotence, everything. He will talk about these things. But what does he tout the most? He touts his love, right? The culmination of all of history is the cross. And what is cross? cross is the, the cross is the greatest show of love in all of history. You know why? People will die for a friend. They'll die for a family member sometimes. But what about dying for your abject enemies? And not only that, being perfect and actually being willing to take all of their sins on your shoulder so that they could be with you for all of eternity. I want you to, like, that is an amazing thing that God did. That's what he touts. Where does he want us to look? First, the cross, right? And, and the cross proves God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave. God so cared more about our need than his comfort that he suffered in our place. And that's just an incredible thing. But then the question is, how do we do this thing called love, right? So we, we I, hopefully you agree at this point that that's the highest calling. But God has equipped us to love. Can we do this? Listen, so this morning, you know, it's kind of a controversial hot topic in the church, but I'm going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit this morning. Now we have, I believe we are equipped by the Spirit to be able to love one another, but God has also given us some, some of us talents, right? So a lot of people are born with kind of talents and inklings towards certain things, right? Just we're, we're, we're programmed that way, and it's a blessing, genetics, and, and, and sometimes God works things in our lives, so we experience things, so we're good at certain things, so we have our talents. And then some of us work hard in life and, and, and all, you know, and, and uh, we might have some free time, and we can give our time to God, and some people financially do well. They can give their possessions to God. But God also gifts us to be able to do things. Now, here's the thing. We talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so often, the gifts of the Holy Spirit take on all this, like, weirdness, right? You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to be like those guys. Those guys are weird, you know? And then those people that are involved in all that, you know, and Holy Spirit everywhere kind of thing, they look at those that, that don't act like them, and they say, well, they're dead, Right? And there's not a real focus, but I dare say, I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit indwelling us as believers is the greatest enabling that we have to fulfill God's greatest commission. So he gives us this great gift to do what? To show off ourselves? To draw attention to ourselves? Why would he give us the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, the dynamite, dynamic, enabling power of the Holy Spirit? Why would he give this to us? And I think a lot of the church has lost focus because what is the greatest thing that we can do? So why is the Holy Spirit given to us? My proposal to you is the primary thing that the Holy Spirit enables us to do is to love God, love each other, and love a lost and dying world. And so it, it takes it away from all this you know, stuff going on all out here. But he specifically equips us with this incredible great gift of the power, the baptism, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, enabled to focus on the greatest thing, which is what? Love. And many times, you know, Paul rebukes in 1 Corinthians, he rebukes them for merely drawing attention to themselves with the spiritual gifts that they've been given. Right? And, and people, well, oh, you know, and, and then they do other things and they blame it on the Holy Spirit. You know, don't blame the Holy Spirit for your wackiness. Now, the Holy Spirit will make you seem odd to the outside world, but once you're in the church congregation and you're, you know, if you're in a prayer meeting and you speak in a tongue, it's so beautiful and natural, right? And, and it just flows because you're amongst believers and you understand and, and you can even feel the Spirit there. But when it gets out of whack and, and, and it becomes showy and show-offy and it becomes this thing that it's not supposed to, guys, it's supposed to teach us to love. And it's supposed to enable us to love, right? And so what is love in the first place? In this world, you know, guys, I have a great dog. I love my dog. I love my wife. Ooh, well, wait a second. Since I said I love my dog first, and then I said I love my wife, that's a, that's a slam, isn't it? Because there's so many different definitions for love. 
People think they, you know, people will tell you they love each other and all they're doing is sleeping with one another and they have no actual affection towards one another or commitment to one another. And so love can mean a, a bunch of different things. So there's a common modern non-biblical definition of love, a feeling of strong or consistent affection for a person. It's all affection. An attraction that includes sexual desire. So it's all sexual. A strong affection felt by people who have a romantic relationship. It's all about the romance, right? A person you love in a romantic way. That's a pretty weak definition of love compared to the Bible's definition of love. Webster's, who Webster was a Christian, his definition includes a better one. He says an unselfish, loyal, that means committed, benevolent concern for the good of another. Oh, that's way deeper. That's way beyond your feelings. My feelings go up and down or not consistent. But if I'm being unselfish, unselfishness is consistent, right? Benevolent, caring for the concern of another above your own. You see, sex without caring about the other person above your own desires is selfish. Sex with commitment is actual a fulfilling of actual love, right? It's, it's a part of love instead of love itself. And there's a great difference there. So concern for others, a fatherly concern of God for humankind, that's love. So practically, what is love? Emotion? Sure, it's there. But I think it follows a determination that leads for the care of another, even at cost to yourself. Right? The care for another concerns even above your own. Right? And I dare say, when you make that commitment, the emotions follow. The emotions are fun. But when I, uh, when I do wedding ceremonies, I don't say, you know, you are committed until your feelings die. Right? It's not like that, right? It's through good times and bad. When it's easy and when it's hard. Until death do us part. It's a commitment to that other person above the needs of oneself. The emotions are there. The, 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 the physical, sexual interactions are there. But it is, it is far beyond the world's definition of love. So, the Spirit of God gives us the ability to love. So, in our first priority, we have loving God. And I dare say, you cannot love one another the way you should unless you set the priority of loving God first, right? And the fact that I love God and God loves me back, he's filled me with his Holy Spirit, allows me to love others. And so if I step away from my love of God, you know who else I'm going to stop loving? In a very practical, passionate, committed way is my wife first, my children next, and all y'all after that. Love is just gone, right, if you don't love God first. And so number one, loving God. How do we love God? Oh, I so love God. How do you love God? That's an interesting question, right? Like, how do you, how do you give a gift to a guy that has everything? And it's like, well, just take me, God. Well, you were so bad, he had to die to rescue you from yourself. Like, what a gift you are, you know? But listen, in the garden, God walked with his creatures in the cool of the day, didn't he? He created his creatures in his image. That means the things that he could give to man, he gave to man. God can't give man everything. God can't give man all presence. He can't give God or man all eternity backwards and forwards. He can't give man these things, but he can give man reason. He can give man the ability to love, to create, to choose, and, and, and to communicate at, at a reasonably deep level. God poured this into this unique creature. Without those things, we're just animals. With those things, we're made in the image of God. And why did God do this? For his pleasure. For his pleasure. And you know what? When we respond to God, it is for our pleasure as well. We get to enjoy God. So in the garden, he created these creatures so that he could have relationship with these creatures. And he said, you can do anything. But as soon as 
you disobey me, and there's only one rule. Like, like one rule. How would you like to go to a school as an elementary school kid with one rule? I'm like, oh, I got this down. No, you don't. You'd still break it because you're human. <laughs> That's what happened in the garden. One rule. And what he said was, as soon as this rule is broken, you will surely die. And we always think of physical death, right? But did they instantaneously die? They didn't. An animal died in their place so they could live a little bit longer, right? But they died not only, they, they would die not only physically, but they would die spiritually. Okay, you will surely die. Instantaneously, there was now a separation between God and man. Jesus, and I think Jesus, in, in the form of Jesus, God came in the garden, I believe. So he would walk with his creatures in the cool of the day and enjoy them face to face. After that, they were restricted from eating from the tree of life. They couldn't hang out in the garden anymore. There, there was angels with swords blocking them from going back into the garden, and they were cast out into the cold, cruel world. They no longer had this deep, intimate relationship with God that he had initially created. Guys, they died spiritually. That's why in the New Testament it says you must be born again, right? You must be born of water, natural, break the water, right? And you must be born of spirit. And so we're born in a state where we don't have the perfect communication with God. And so there's a point in time in your life when you receive Jesus Christ into your life and that sin is done away with, right? And now you have fellowship with God once again. What he lost in the garden, he only lost one thing in the garden. We lost everything in the garden. Acceptance, you know, understanding, the ability to communicate well with one another, you know, uh, Every, I mean, we lost everything. God only lost one thing in the garden. His deep, intimate fellowship with man. You know what he regained at the cross? His deep, intimate fellowship with man. The greatest way that you can love God back is to spend time with God as his child because that's how he originally created you and that's what he lost in the garden. It's not to go to church. It's not to do a bunch of ritualistic things. It's not to come to church work day. It, you know, it's not all those things. A lot of these things are awesome. They're good. But I believe the greatest way that you can love God back is spending daily time with him. Guys, and, and, and we want to, um, you know, in our church, we have a very practical thing that we want everybody in our church to do. I want everybody here to, to be determined to spend daily time with God. That's my greatest goal. It, it's better than being at church on Sunday morning. It's better, being, better than being at women's Bible studies or men's Bible studies. It is being in daily fellowship. But see, if you're in daily fellowship with God, you also want to be with God's people. It's amazing how that works. Because you fall out of, out of, God's, you fall out of love with God's people when you fall out of love with God, right? <laughs> and you stop fellowshipping. And so that's very practical is to spend time with God. So how does the Spirit help us love God back, right? Well, Romans 8, 15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit comes into your life, and all of a sudden, you're like, Daddy, right? How distant were you from God before you gave your heart to God? Then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I know God. That's the spirit of God in your life saying, Abba, Father, Daddy. And that is a beautiful gift. Why would God give that to us? So that we can love him as his children. If you have little children, do they ever ignore you for a day? Some of you mothers of young children. I'm talking about young children. I'm not talking about older children. I'm talking about young children. You mothers of young children sometimes go, I wish that would happen every once in a while, right? Like, just leave me alone. I want to talk to an adult or whatever. But little children will not leave you alone. Why do you leave God alone? Have you grown out of him? Guys, hopefully by the end of this month or next month, I'll have my doctorate degree. God doesn't care. He could care less if my relationship with him stinks and I never spend time with him. That's nothing to God. He wants me. And he doesn't want me to come. I'm a pastor. I'm an author. I'm on the radio. I speak at conferences. We planted a couple churches in Brazil. Do I go on? We're part of Hannah's ministry. Boy, we're special. You know, I mean, all that's great and everything. But 
He wants to spend time with me as his child. So I come as a kid to God in my daily time. I study in my office for you guys. But I spend time with God for God in the morning. And I'm not studying for you guys. It's me and God. It's me giving my gift to God. It's me saying, God, I love you. And he gives me a spirit as a grown man that is like a child that says, Abba, Father, Daddy. Remember, if you don't come to God as a child, you don't belong in the kingdom of God. So don't come to God as a hot shot. Come as a kid. Come as his baby. I don't care how old you are. You're a baby to God, right? Be a child of God. And guys, everything else flows from that. Because you can love God in many different ways. But I'm telling you, the most important way to God, love God, he gave us his spirit to do. Daddy. And that's what he wants. It's all about relationship. Not about performance, right? Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, and I would say sons and daughters, <laughs> God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out what? Abba, Father. If you go to Israel with us, 2020, March. If you go to Israel with us, and you spend any time in the Jewish quarter, and the kids get out of school, and they have all their little ringlets, and they're running around, you know, and, and everything, and, and then their dad shows up. They go, Abba, 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 Abba. And it's so cool. It's Dada. It's literally Dada. And, and, and this is how God wants you to come to him, and he gives you the spirit that enables you to do so. So, would you agree that the spirit of God gives us a child's heart towards him and a desire to come to him often and humbly? And the Spirit gives us that pure, simple love for God. And the Spirit helps us fulfill the first part of the great commandment, to love God. How else does the Spirit help us love God in a, in a practical way? Well, in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, it says, When the Holy Spirit came on the church there on the day of Pentecost, the people that heard them speaking, they said this, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So listen, on the day of Pentecost, they weren't, when they received the gift of tongues, they weren't witnessing to people. They were being a witness of God by praising God. You see that there? They were speaking the wonderful works of God in their own tongues. So people were able to listen in on their worship. That's what was happening there. The gift of tongues helps us do what? Love God. Everywhere where we understand the content of the gift of tongues, it's a praise language from man's heart to God, right? It says, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, right? First Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, talk, it's the most concentrated area talking about the gifts of God. Chapter 14, verse 15. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also, also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. When I sing worship, I'm not singing to you. I'm singing to God. Over the years, I've been the worship leader in our church, uh, first three and a half years for sure, and I've had people come, I love the teaching of the Word, but your worship is pretty bad. You know, <laughs> like, 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 Compliment me and destroy me in the same sentence, you know. But uh, <laughs> this is what I think in my head. I don't tell them this, but I think, well, the worship's not to you anyways. And I think my, my heavenly father appreciates it, right? It isn't for my entertainment. That's the hard thing about worship today because contemporary Christian music has now become worship music, and now we judge everybody's worship team, you know. And, and I know these guys. These Calvary Chapel, South Maui. It's a small church in Maui, and and this is their worship. It's, it's really, Corp and you guys and, and Riley, you are their worship. They're, they're their worship team, you know? And, uh, and what a blessing to just have sweet hearts unto God. And it's not to be judged by us. We're to join in in worshiping God. And so when people pray out in a tongue, it is a prayer language to worship God. Doesn't it take a lot of the mystery out of it? And personally, I do, I do have that gift. And and I don't think I'm special because I have that gift. I think I'm special needs because, because I have that gift. And this is me personally. Why? Because I'm a nerd. I'm a Bible nerd. Everything I think in my heart to pray about, I filter. Okay? And I, I water it down because I'm always thinking about the theological implications that I don't just want to abandon my love to, you know, and, and I don't want to be extravagant because I want to make sure that I'm right, you know, and I water down my prayers. And so my, my wife, my daughters pray. They pray beautiful prayers. Woo! Details, everything, and longer, and, 
Dear God, thank you so much for the food. Amen. You know, I mean, I, you know, and for me, I just feel like God gave me this gift so that I can kind of abandon myself in praise to God because I'm not naturally like that as much. You know, and, and for other reasons, the Holy Spirit gives to whoever he wants for different things. And some people have the gift of tongues, some don't. But for me, it helps me love God. So that's one of those gifts that help me love God. It's a spiritual gift. And guys, doesn't that take the mystery out of it? Because everywhere where we know the content of the gift of tongues, it's praising of God. And it's a prayer from God, the man's heart to God, as opposed to the other way around. You know, and so that's one, one of the gifts that, that just kind of shows what... Uh, God is able to do with his gifts. And so the Spirit gives us the attitude of a loving child and their daddy, gives us the power to be a witness unto him and all kinds of other, other things, okay? Now, number two, we're supposed to love one another, each other, your Christian family. So what's a pra- what is practical love towards a brother or sister? You know, many times I'll, I'll have, you know, a couple in counseling and they've been married for a while and they, you know, and they're having a struggle, therefore they're seeing me and it not everybody who sees me has a struggle, <laughs> but, but sometimes they'll come in and they're like, can you help us through this? And, and sometimes it's pretty bad because they haven't done it God's way. If you do it God's way, it's going to work. But if you don't do it God's way, or, or one or, uh, of the two doesn't do it God's way, it's going to be miserable, you know? And so, um, and not always miserable, but it's going to be harder um, and, uh, and all. So, so sometimes people come to me and they'll, they'll be, you know, let's just say the man's there, and he's going, I really love my wife. I go, stop, stop telling me that. Show your wife that you love her. You can convince me and still not love your wife, right? And what does love look like? Men, is it okay to tell your wife you love her? Absolutely, she wants to hear that. But you know what? It's even better to say it and to show her. Because love is actually a verb, you need to show love, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it needs to have legs. What, is it, what does it look like, right? And, and show, so showing practical love towards a brother is, is being sacrificial, caring about them, doing something for them, taking away of your time or your resources, or your talents or whatever, and putting it into them, right? My, my wife loves getting gifts from me, but my wife loves more getting personal notes from me, right, men? clue in, all right, you know, that's, that's a hint I've had to learn over the years, because I wasn't always so good at it, okay, First John 3, 16, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, but whoever has this world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in, in him, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Again, 1 Corinthians talks about it. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Without the Lord, most of us are really selfish. And some of you are not as selfish, but with the Lord, you would be more selfless, even if you're selfless without the Lord. But selflessness and concern for our brothers and sisters, serving one another, bearing each other's burdens, bearing each other's needs. You know? And... Um, you know, so just before service, I was talking with a couple over here, and their, their child was sick to the point of being in the hospital. I'm going, call us. You know, certainly we, we want to pray for you, at, you know, at least. And, and if you have any other needs, we want to meet those needs. And we really do at this church. We want the, our love to show. Excuse me, your love is showing, you know. I'm not a booger or anything. It's like your love is showing. Let it show. It's a good thing to let it show, okay, that, that concern for others. And, and that is by the Spirit indwelling us, right? The Spirit enables us to do, do so through the transformation and gifting. So we have the fruit of the Spirit, don't we? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Do you guys know anybody around you that, that is like that? They probably really bug you. You don't like them, do you? That's not true, right? These are the people you love to be around, right? And it's the person you should want to be. But the, the Spirit enables us to be that person. I was looking around, like, over the last month, the busy bees who serve to the bone, <laughs> you know? Uh, my wife and I and my daughter, by helping us put on a, a wedding for my daughter. And uh, that's by the Holy Spirit. 
That's by the Holy Spirit. We can't thank these people enough, but the Holy Spirit can. And the Holy Spirit implants him and enables them to love us back as we've loved them over time. What a beautiful thing, right? Again, the Holy Spirit, ooh, ah, oh, weird, what's... But the Holy Spirit's primary focus is the same primary focus of Jesus, right? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Spirit is one in essence, right? If you, have, if you have three people that think all the same thoughts and have all the same priorities, they're all one in essence, right? They're never going to make a separate choice. And so when the Holy Spirit indwells you, the Holy Spirit is going to fulfill in you those words that Jesus spoke on earth, right? And so he fills us to enable us to do what? Love one another. You can have joy towards yourself, but joy is really shown when it's poured out on another person, right? And so it's a beautiful thing. In 1 Corinthians 12, again, talking about the gifts, Paul says, but the manifestation or the showing of the Spirit is given to each one, what? For you to show off and draw attention to yourself. It's amazing how different the translations are. No, just kidding. But <laughs> it's for what? It's the profit of all. God doesn't give you gifts for you to be a big shot, right? Listen, if I have the gift of teaching, it's not for me to, to, to show off. It's for you to grow, okay? Now, I can sit. So if, if God gives me the gift of teaching, I go, man, I got the gift of teaching. I can go into a closet and teach all day long. What am I benefiting? Nothing until I start teaching someone else. So the only gift that is meant directly to be given to God is the gift of tongues. Every other gift is meant to be given away to other people to be effective. And that's exactly what Paul says, right? He says tongues edify the person that's praying because worship edifies us, doesn't it? And unless there's interpretation, everybody's just looking at like, oh, great, there they go. Nice show. But if you have an interpretation, then other people can join in. And I really think it's mostly a private prayer language, right? It's a prayer and praise language. I go on a lot of mission trips. I go to a lot of countries. A lot of times I don't know the language very well. I know Portuguese sort of, enough to get me in trouble. But when I'm in a Portuguese worship service and I don't know the song, I can pray or I can praise God. It's, a, it's, it's nice, but it's to God. It's not to others. It's to him. He knows what I'm saying. But the rest of the gifts, every single one of them is meant to be given away. Doesn't that kind of start to make sense, right? He doesn't give you gifts to show off or be selfish. He gives you gifts to give to other people so that we can show love towards one another. So we've, given, we've been given the gift and the fruit of the Holy Spirit to love each other, right? Practically how it's done, towards service, towards one another, spirit-motivated. The gift of helps. Oh, boy, we see that a lot around here. I don't have it. Sorry. I can still help. I just don't have it. But... Uh, the gift of giving. We have some people in this church that have the gift of giving. And, and it's amazing. A radio station survives on the gift of giving. You know, and, and it's amazing. And, and, and half of our retreat people get to go to a retreat because someone else has given in their place. And it's amazing. It's a beautiful gift. You know? And uh, so we have the gift of giving. We, we, we have this care, this uh, physical and spiritual care that, that we care for one another. So there's the gift of mercy. That, that, that you hear someone's in the hospital and you have to drop everything to get there. Now, we all are called to have mercy because we've experienced mercy, but some people have given, been given this extra dose of mercy. There's a gift of faith, the, will, the, the ability to step out beyond what others would step out. Now, we're all called to have faith, and if you're a believer, you have faith, but some people have been given the gift of faith. I have a friend, Lance Cook. You, you hear about him. He's on my board. I call him my big brother spiritually. He's uh, out in, in uh, La Habra, California. When I go with this guy, like when we went out to Hurricane Katrina, he goes, ah, just pick us up, you know, get, get two 15-passenger vans, we'll meet you in Houston. We're like, we don't have 15-passenger vans. And he goes, yeah, by the way, find us a place to stay. So we called like all day, me and my assistant pastor, we called all day in every single hotel because Hurricane Katrina had hit, was either damaged or it was full of relief workers. And so Lance is going, Rod, my little brother, Pick, a, pick up 25 of us in Houston in a couple days and find us a place to stay. 25, just 25. No big deal. We can't find anything. We're going, oh, what are we going to do, you know? So then some guy walks into the office and he goes, he, he comes in and he just kind of walks and he goes, yeah, I saw your Calvary Chapel sign out there. 
My son goes to a Calvary Chapel out in California. Pastor's name is Lance Cook. What? He goes, yeah, and I, I, I don't know. I was just thinking I'm down here selling bolts to the, the oil people. We have, a, we have a bolt company. And he goes, we have a nice house in Baton Rouge. And if you guys need a place to stay to help with hurricane relief, we got, yeah, it's like 4,000 square foot house. Y- y'all invited. <laughs> Lance had enough faith for me, <laughs> right? You know? A few days later, we're staying at this guy's house, and, and Baton Rouge was relatively unaffected. And, and then we go down to New Orleans. Guys, we go to New Orleans. Lance says a few words to the police officers that are keeping everybody out because of looting and the guns and all the crazy stuff going on and all the water and bodies floating, all this crazy stuff. It, it wasn't as bad as the news was making it. Fake news, right? But anyways, <laughs> it was a pretty serious situation, though, right? Lance talks to this guy for less, less than two minutes. A cop car pulls out in front of our two vans and, and p- turns on its sirens and its lights, and we get escorted all the way right downtown in New Orleans, a bunch of chaplains and pastors. Lance, what are you doing? The next day, we go into Bay St. Louis. Lance talks to the mayor and the fire chief, and they give us a city baseball field, and they said, we'll take care of your sewage and we'll take care of all your electricity. You can have it for at least a year. I go back a month later, it's like three ter- circus tents on this thing, and there's hundreds of people serving thousands of people every day, and hundreds of houses being reclaimed from the hurricane. Lance Cook has a gift of faith. And it's just amazing. I love it. I don't have it. I try to do it all the time. It just doesn't work like that. But he has that gift. It's beyond him to do what he does, you know? But he, serve, he doesn't use it for Lance to be glorified. He uses it to minister to people. And he gives it away. You see how that works? And so what is a prophecy? Well, prophecy is, is from God's heart to man. And, and, and in the Old Testament, they would write scriptures, and they would have all this authority. They didn't really have a church structure. But in the New Testament, you, you see the roles change. And, and, and since we have the word of God, the word of God sets up the fences, and we're not to go out the, outside of those fences. Do not be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. You're not allowed, as a believer, to marry an unbeliever, right? That's the fence. Who do you marry? That's the detail. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in, right? And so someone might have a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, which are types of prophecy, or a a prophetic word, or they might just have a vision or a dream at night. Man, it's weird. I had this weird dream about you. And you're like, oh, that means a lot in my life right now. I'm trying to make this decision. Or I have a verse for you. And they give you a verse just out of the blue. And they're working on the details. But guys, they don't own your life. God speaks to you through the word, through preaching, through a song, through friends, but it always has to correspond to the rules of the word of God. That's our fence that we stay in. And and, and you test all things and hold on to that which is true. And so prophecy isn't so weird. If someone gives you a prophecy, you know, they go, yeah, I was just praying about this and and you came on my heart and whatever. They don't even know they're giving it to you half the time. And that's fine because it should operate in a natural way. Not, thus saith the Lord, brother, fall down, you know, or whatever. And some people do that and it's still, you know, it's it's their style or whatever. But, But in all reality, it's now my responsibility to take it back to the Lord and say, what do you want to do with this? Every time a prophecy is given in the New Testament, the, the recipient has to now go to God, what do you want me to do with it? Example, Agabus, prophet in the New Testament, only one really mentioned specifically with a name, who we have as recorded prophecies. We have two of them, but one of them was when Paul was headed to Jerusalem. He takes Paul's belt and he ties himself up and he says, this is gonna happen to the man that owns his belt. You're gonna be captured. He didn't say, now, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, did he? He didn't say that. He just gave him the prophecy and walked away. We have, we have people that come in, I'm a prophet of God, and you need to listen to me. And they're normally looking for money, too, right? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what I say to them is, give me your prophecy, and we'll see you later. I'm like, no, no, that's not how it goes. I'm supposed to now run your church, basically, is what they're trying. No, 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 no. That's not how it works in the Bible. If it's a message from God, now you give it to me, and now it's my responsibility to test it and now hold on to that which is true. Didn't that bring the mystery and the fear out of that gift, right? Because you have just as much of a relationship with God as the prophet that comes to you. In the Old Testament, it wasn't that way. The prophet was filled with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was not on everybody. And he was only filled with the Spirit at times. But since we have been completely cleansed through the death of Jesus Christ, we full-time have the Holy Spirit in our life. And so now it operates differently because now you can test all things and hold on to that which is true. 
kind of removes the ooh ah mystery. Guys, you need to understand, I am a charismatic in the sense of I absolutely believe, but I believe in what the Word says about how the Holy Spirit works and the priority of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we're given these gifts of service, of ministry. My gift of teaching isn't for me, it's for you, right? And, and, and so my gift of exhortation isn't for me, it's for you, right? And if you have gifts, those gifts are for other people unless it's a gift of tongues, and then you build yourself up so you can bless others more. See how that works? That's a beautiful thing. So we, we get this so that we can love one another within the body of Christ together. And that's my view. I'm sticking to it. Anyway, <laughs> so we, we love one another. And thirdly, we're to love the lost. How does the Spirit help us do this? And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then skip down to verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Guys, without the Holy Spirit in my life, I am not, well, put it this way. I'd be a witness. I just wouldn't be a good one. Right? I can claim to be a Christian and be a lousy witness. You're a witness. You might be a lousy one. Be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you are a good witness. Because you are a witness. It doesn't give you a squirm room. It doesn't say, you should receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, come upon you. And if you want to be, you shall be witnesses. And it doesn't even say you shall go witnessing. Because that kind of lets you off the hook. I'm not witnessing so I can be a jerk. No, that's not true. If you be a witness, you be a witness all the time. Which means during Christmas time, you be a witness in line. It means during your daily commute on Corpus Christi freeways where people, they're either aggressive or they're too passive or whatever. You know, it's like we have too many people from too many different places. In California, I know you're going to be aggressive, right? Here, I don't know. You're going to be aggressive or not, like because everybody's from somewhere else. You know, it's crazy out here. And you can get so upset. On, you know what? You're being a witness right there. And if you can't be, take your Calvary chip, Chapel sticker off the back of your car. <laughs> or your 911 sticker. Uh, but anyways, the ability to be a witness and the boldness to fulfill your calling is a blessing of the Spirit. And you've been given a boldness by the Spirit. And there's also a gift called the gift of evangelism as well. Now, we're all called to evangelize, but there's some people that I've gone out street witnessing with. I, I used to you know, be a youth pastor, and I would take my kids out every other week. We'd go to the malls, and we'd go to the movie theaters or whatever, sometimes concerts, and we would go street witnessing. <laughs> and one of, one of my kids had the gift of evangelism. He was horrible explaining the gospel. I was the teacher. I was his mentor. And I would give the best gospel presentation a la Billy Graham ever, Greg Laurie. And the person would go, eh, walk away. You know, I'm like, what? You know? And this guy would like go, baloney sandwich, you want to know Jesus? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, it's so awesome. Guys, understand, when God gives you a gift, he gives you a gift because you need the gift. Right? Sometimes we glorify people with a lot of gifts or seemingly, like for me, I have a gift to teach, so I end up being a teacher, so I'm in front of people. It's not because I'm awesome that God gave me the gift of teaching. God had a call on my life, so he better give me the gift of teaching because I wouldn't be very good at it unless he did. So I don't think I'm a hot shot, and I don't think I'm better than you. I just think all of us are supposed to use our gifts. And if God gave me a gift of teaching, it's because I actually needed it, not because I was awesome. He wanted me to be a teacher, so he had to give me the gift of teaching. That's a humbling thing. And guys, sometimes I feel like I teach a horrible message, and you guys, oh, man, that spoke to me. I'm like... Totally the Lord. That's the gift of teaching. Because I, I can say dumb things, and between my mouth and your heart, God does something with the message. And it's not my brilliance. It's a gift. And so I humbly know that, that if people grow under me, I praise God, because I'm not awesome. The Holy Spirit in me is awesome. Everything is awesome. Anyways, I'm sorry. <laughs> But that ability to love the lost. So the Spirit allows us to love God, love each other, and love a lost and dying world. 
and there's number four. We're not going to talk about that today. But, um, but, but that is our philosophy of ministry. And you need to understand, the Spirit is not bad. Don't be afraid of the Spirit of God. And I was raised Baptist, so in, and our church wasn't anti-Holy Spirit. They just never really talked about the Holy Spirit. So it was like kind of ignorance Holy Spirit kind of stuff. It wasn't like we're going to talk against Him. We're not just going to talk about Him, right? And it was weird to me because I'd read the Bible, and it's like, this doesn't make sense. Why don't you explain this to me? And my dad came to me one day, and, and, and he goes like this. And he, he was deacons and elders and all this different stuff during the years. And he goes, Rod, I believe the Spirit actually moves today. And he got in trouble once from the elders in the church because he went to a hospital room, and he prayed for someone to be healed. He literally got in trouble. And isn't that weird? Because we're supposed to do that. It's in the Bible, right? By faith. You know, and, and so... The Spirit isn't bad. And I don't even care if you call it the baptism of the Spirit. What I care about for you guys is that you just want to be everything that you can possibly can be for God and for others. And if you want to be everything that God wants you to be, and you're surrendered in your life, God can fill you beyond what you can even understand yourself. He can, and he will, and he desires to. You don't have to have the phraseology right. God knows what to do when your heart is surrendered. I think there's some guys that absolutely deny the gift of the Spirit, but they're so surrendered to God that they're filled with the Spirit anyways. Because God is not subject to our feelings, our emotions, and our attitudes. He's not, he, he is not locked in by our bad theology. See what I'm saying? Like, God's going to do what he's going to do in you because he has purposes for you beyond you. And I'm so glad because... If I only limited myself to what I thought was good about me, I wouldn't get to experience half the stuff I get to experience because I'm so limited and God has greater thoughts towards me than I can even have towards myself. And so I want to surrender to that God that is so far beyond me and has so much more for me than I could ever imagine. I mean, Matt came to me yesterday. He goes, can, can you imagine how many lives you've affected over the years? And every so often God will, will encourage me because... You know, as a pastor, you focus on the problems, the fires going on. You're a fireman. It's like, oh, i got to solve this, and like life is crazy, and everything stinks. But then you don't look around. There's two people that are struggling. There's three or 400 people that are doing awesome in God in your midst, and, and you're, like, focused on the bad things. So every so often, God will open that up. So I looked around the room. There's, like, 15 wet, wet marriages I'd done in there, premaritals. Probably another five or six marriages that were on the edge that, that God used me through a counseling of his word to, to, to heal. And now they're rocking for God. It's like... Wow, this is, you know, it's like, well, yeah, thank you, God, and thank you, Matt, for that encouragement, because sometimes we get so focused on the bad things, but guys, never think it's you, but be willing and be surrendered, and you'll be able to look back on your life and go, you know, I was a school teacher in Corpus Christi for 35 years, but you know how many lives you touched during that time? I worked in a restaurant, but I was a sold-out servant for God working in a restaurant. You know how many lives you changed over all those years because the Holy Spirit's working through you with the gifts and you're willing to say, hey, God, whatever you want, I am surrendered to you. I want to watch you move around me. I want to be in awe of what you do around me. Man, be that person. Be, be that, that, that you know, stop sign lady that helps people across the street. Guys, my wife and I still remember our junior high lunch lady. And she was a Christian woman. And she used to pray for us kids in junior high. And, and we still remember her. We could go to her house. She'd remember our name. She'd pull out cookies and talk to us for hours. And, and it, huge effect. My science teacher, or my history teacher, Mr. Cruzy, my wife also had him at a different school. I showed up 15 years later to teach a Bible study at the junior high school he was teaching at. He looked at me. He started crying. He goes, I've been praying for you for all these years. And he goes, yeah, your friend was Danny. Yeah, Danny was a nut, right? He's a mess. How's he doing now? Well, Danny's walking with the Lord now. Mr. Cruz, he'd been praying for him. Dawn, and, and another friend of mine, Gary. Gary was a whack job. In junior high, Gary used to put um, Sigram 7 in his, in his lunch pail and get wasted at school. Gary is walking strong with the Lord today. Mr. Cruz, he prayed for all of us, and I got to give him the update. So he cried when he saw me, but I wasn't as bad as the other guys that I hung out with. And then he started bawling when I started telling him about the effect of his prayers throughout life. And guys, he was a social studies teacher. You want to make a difference? Be surrendered to God. You don't have to be a pastor. In fact, please, be what God has called you to be. Don't try to be something else other than you are, and be surrendered to God. Again, you don't have to call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
but just be open to whatever God has for you because it's not bad. What does it say in Luke 11? If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Not unless you're a bad father, right? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil sinners, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to him who asks? Right? And it's not a question of your salvation, but just really of your surrender. And guys, it's, it's like pouring water into a cup. And you can segment that cup out and keep water out of some of that area, right? But it's just like, no, I want you to fill all of it. What you have for me, I want it all to be full. And what do we do? God's not a bully. Sometimes we kind of push out his influence out of parts of our lives too, right? And that's why we can ask, well, I want to be refilled. It doesn't mean that, you know, you lost the Holy Spirit, like you left your life. But what you're saying is, I want to resurrender. That's really the words you're saying. I want to resurrender this part because I, I pulled it back from you. And you're not a bully. And if I want to pull back this part of my life, you kind of let me. And then it really stinks. And then we have a service like this, and God's telling you, let it go again. Let me fill that part of your life also. You see how that works? And so, guys, if you have questions about this, because a lot of you are new to our church over the last year, if you have questions about this, yes, I'm a wild charismatic, but I'm not a wild-eyed, crazy, weird, blame it on God charismatic. I want to be more charismatic than anybody on earth in God's way. I want the Spirit to do everything through me. I don't want my flesh to do it. I don't want my brains to do it. I want God to be working through me to fulfill what his desire is. And the greatest thing we can do is love God, love each other, and love a lost and dying world. And we have the equipment to be able to do so. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you uh, for your plan, God. You didn't just tell us to believe and then leave these sinful minds here to figure it out. Lord, you've equipped us to be able to do the things you've called us to do. And so, Lord, may it be that we get off our high horses thinking we can do it on our own and just trust you more in the Spirit. Lord, for us here who have resisted that surrender, I just pray that those would surrender today. And for others that have taken back parts of their lives, I just pray that they would surrender today, God. And Lord, may Calvary Chapel, the coastlands, be known as a place that loves you, spends time with you as their children, loves each other, that this be a loving place. That be our greatest form of evangelism in a sense, that, that the world would see that the church is not just crazy and splitting all the time, but they actually love one another. And may it be that we learn to love those people that we think are crazy that we see with your eyes the fact that they're not our enemy. They're, cap they're captors of our enemy. And Lord, you have given us the weapons and the tools to set them free. And may it be our passion. Lord, may we be known for our love above our intellect, above our stylish worship or our tin building church, whatever it is. May we be known more for our love than anything else, God, that you may be glorified. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.